start shortly. The proceeding will 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 start shortly.
The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. The proceeding will start shortly. Good morning. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, before I ask you to introduce yourselves, I'm obliged to read out the following, which is pretty self-evident. As you'll know, this session is open to the public. A webcast of the session goes out live and is subsequently accessible via the parliamentary website. A verbatim transcript will be taken of your evidence and put on the parliamentary website. You will have the opportunity to make minor corrections for the purposes of clarification or accuracy. Perhaps you would like to introduce yourselves and then we'll get to the first question. Elizabeth. I am a senior research fellow at RUSI and I lead the Modern Deterrence Project there. Ben? Good morning. Uh, my name is Ben Scott. I uh, direct policy and advocacy for Luminate, which is a London-based part of a charity run by Pierre Omidyar. Lisa. Good morning. I'm Lisa Maria Neudert. I'm a doctoral candidate at the Oxford Internet Institute and researcher there. And most recently, I have served as the secretary um, to the Oxford Commission on Technology and Elections, Oxtech. Paddy. 
Good morning. My name is Paddy McGuinness, and I was a commissioner on this commission at the Oxford Internet Institute. I'm a senior advisor at Brunswick Group, which is a critical issues firm, and previously I was the UK's deputy national security advisor, leading on resilient security and intelligence, including the security of elections and the democratic process. That's great. I will, if you don't mind, call you by your Christian names, but when you'll see the transcripts, it'll all become formalised. Uh, makes life, it just makes life a little easier for me. First question from Lord Harris, if I may. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've received written evidence from the government which tells us that, to date, there has been, not been any evidence of successful interference in UK democratic processes. Uh, what I'd be interested in hearing is your views on to what extent we should be concerned about foreign interference in UK elections, and actually how resilient are our democratic institutions against uh, interference, perhaps if you like against the use of uh, dark money from malign uh, actors. Uh, thank you for that question. I think it doesn't actually matter whether interference has taken place if the public discourse suggests that it has taken place. So if we look at uh, the United States, for example, uh, there is, it's disputed or uh, being hotly debated whether Russia influenced the 2016 election, to what extent it influenced it and to what end. But what matters is that Americans think the Russians did influence, did interfere with the election. So there was a, a poll by YouGov and The Economist in 2018 that suggested or that showed that 50% of Americans think that the Russians interfered with the 2016 elections, which is a, a frightening figure because then it doesn't really matter whether they did, Americans believe they did. I think the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. And I think we have to recognize the growing sophistication of organized actors who would interfere in elections. The playbook from 2016, which I watched as a part of Mrs. Clinton's presidential campaign, uh, was a very clumsy, overt attempt at interference. Buying ads with rubles is not covert intelligence activity. <laughs> that is shameless, brazen interference in another country's election. What we're seeing now is a lot more sophisticated. What we're seeing now is not the purchase of Facebook advertisements through the front door using rubles and an address in St. Petersburg. What you're seeing now is dark money channeled through different shell organizations, paid PR organizations that set up inauthentic accounts on social media by the hundreds. For example, in the recent European parliamentary elections last spring, we had a case where some entity set up thousands of false Facebook accounts in Germany and used them to amplify and expand the reach of content from a single political party in the German election. It was out in the open. It was obvious for anyone who was paying attention and the research community spotted it. Notably, Facebook did not spot it. The German intelligence agencies and law enforcement officials if they spotted it, did not shut it down. And it resulted in a substantial increase in the visibility of one party over the others through a, an, a deceptive and illegitimate means. These are the kinds of techniques that I think we will see more and more. There will be money paid to third parties to generate artificial traffic on social media that gives certain voices more volume, more prominence in the public debate than they actually represent. And that's a dangerous form of influence, not only because of its actual influence, but because of the perception amongst the public that integrity of democracy is weakened. Marie. I think when we are thinking about the impact of disinformation of interference, there is a misconception to always think about impact on behavior. Does it have an impact on how people have voted? Does it have an impact on um, the views that people have on a certain political issue? But really, it's much more also not just about behavior, but it is about perception. How does the public perceive the pillars of democracy right now? How does the public perceive um, 
are our elections, is there actually election integrity? Are our elections free and fair? Is there still truth and trust in the political system? And that can be undermined. And that is also exactly what we are seeing where the Russian playbook and where many other foreign playbooks are trying to target. It's not about disseminating a specific message, but it is much more about sowing distrust in the institutions and the political system in general. And to the question of how resilient democracies are to that, I think any democracy, and any democracy will have, any democracy will have some form of conflict, some form of issue. And that is exactly where disinformation techniques start their narratives. So you have a divisive topic, um, you have division within the public. It could be a Brexit referendum, it could be a Scottish referendum, questions around immigration. And then you have a foreign actor, you have a malicious actor um, that is disseminating stories about that, often to both sides about the, of the political spectrum to foster more and more distrust, more and more public confusion. Thank you very much indeed. Paddy. So I'm going to differ slightly. I'd like to just, first of all, frame this slightly for, for the committee, because it seems important to me as someone who comes out of the national security world, I suppose a securocrat for most of my professional life, that we understand where this sits in the hierarchy of techniques that a foreign state, let's say Russia, can bring to bear. And we need to understand that when we think about the digital space, this is the least and the easiest of their tactics, and you could divide it into three. So. At the height, there are going to be what might be called quasi-kinetic military weapons, things you would use in a strategic conflict to have an effect on an opponent, and there you'd be trying to interfere with network systems uh, in the way that you might with a bomb or electromagnetic pulse weapon. And, and that is kept deeply hidden and rarely brought out and shown and is the thing that is really valued by a military-dominated hierarchy like Russia. Secondly, you've got a set of techniques which are covert action techniques but which leave very firm fingerprints and have real-world effect. They make machines behave differently. And you might use those you know, to interfere with Ukraine's power supply uh, or whatever it might be. Right? And, and those you will use in peacetime and you might use around significant political events and you might even consider using them against automated or networked voting systems. So when we think about interference, we need to be clear what we're talking about, because in this country we vote on paper, but of course in the United States they don't, and that opens up a whole vista of difficulty. We only have to look at the difficulty in Iowa today to understand how that can be done. And then you get into this area. I remember when we were working against um, uh, terrorists, and I'm happy to talk about this, even though we're not in a kind of classified arena, because the government has talked about it. And over the years, we've, walk, we've worked against terrorists, and of course, they've been active uh, online, Al-Qaeda and Islamic State. And I remember us working against them, and I remember military colleagues in the Ministry of Defense talking about this being messing about on the internet, that we were having some effect on the uh, terrorists, but it was nothing like you could have with a quasi-kinetic network weapon. So I think we need to understand where this sits in the hierarchy and understand that I think the significance of what the Russians have done or do around elections is that of intent and, and that of the high-handedness of the Russian regime, that they really understand where the threshold is for intervention and the law of armed conflict, and they stay well below it. And then they give their agencies free reign, which is why you end up with not one but two Russian agencies hacking the Democratic National Convention, which only, you know, no disciplined governmental system would do because it's a waste of capability. First of all, two others, quickly. I'm really disturbed by the idea that we're internet zombies. Okay, I think there is a, an exaggeration of the effect that can be had through network systems upon our intent. Some can be had, but I'm very sceptical, and I worry that if we accept the premise that something profound can be done to all of us, or to the majority of us, or a significant number of us, simply by manipulating uh, messages to us on the basis of our Facebook likes, I'm really disturbed at the idea, because I think it delegitimizes the vote and it's something we've got to avoid, which brings me on to my third point, and I'm happy to go into more detail on that, which brings me on to my third point, we mustn't do the Russians' work for them, 
One, I would love to be a GRU officer responsible for these campaigns, and the reason I'd love that is the, thresh, the success threshold's really low. All I've got to do is get you a little bit more off balance at a time when you're vulnerable, and you're particularly vulnerable during an election. One of the reasons why at the Oxford Commission we very consciously turned away from the threat story, which understandably you started with, and got into the resilience story, is we wanted to define what we as a society can do for ourselves to reduce any malign effect. Because by concentrating on the threat, what we do is we talk up the Russians and we make them 10 foot tall and we increase the perception that our elections are vulnerable and may not be legitimate. Whereas the reality is they can have very little effect on us. Sadly, there's a bit of a, there's a, bit of a kind of conspiracy of silence around the true ability to have effect through network systems because it's profoundly not in the interest of the advertising industry to admit how little effect can be had, mm -hmm. how much they're communicating with botnets, not with human beings, and how little, you know, how few of us are truly influenced to do something we don't really mean to do by what they sell and, of course, what, what they pay social media platforms for. So we need to be, I think, quite sceptical. Okay. Can I just follow up? Because, I mean, uh, this is quite important. What you're telling us is, one, we shouldn't be internet zombies, uh, but two, the government's test of whether it's successful interference is the wrong test under any set of circumstances. The question is, uh, you know, it's not whether a result was changed, it's whether there is confidence in it. So if that's the case, what are the appropriate responses, given that uh, it's all driven by social media and digital technologies, what's the appropriate response from uh, the UK government or any nation state to try and protect people's feelings that their democracy uh, has integrity? I think it's to involve the population. I, I worry when, when we have these investigations that show that the government should do more to, to protect uh, voting machines, um, uh, the software and systems and so forth. And I must congratulate the committee on scheduling this hearing for today. I know you, you thought about when, when uh, the Iowa caucus will be taking place and, and scheduled it accordingly. And I think this is a perfect example of election interference. So we don't know what happened with those apps that the Democrats use in Iowa, but everybody's first assumption or fear is that somebody hacked them. It could just be that an inept, an inept IT company developed it, but now we are already uh, worrying about the legitimacy of the outcome of the Democratic uh, nomination in Iowa. Uh, so to go back to, to your question, Lord Harris, um, a good example is what Latvia does. So Latvia, small country, what can they do to protect themselves? Well, they have this new national security curriculum that's being rolled out to, to all senior schools or, or high schools in the country where kids are taught what the, the threats are facing the country, what the government does to, to protect the country, and what they themselves can do. Because if we are not taught about it, our uh, as citizens, our uh, instinct is always to think that the government can somehow uh, put up an even more powerful or even larger umbrella over us so that we don't have to worry about this or that threat. Well, the government uh, cannot do that. It doesn't have enough resources or, resources or money, and it would be a complete waste of, of this phenomenal resource that is the population where we can actually play a role. Uh, it would be a waste to, to just assume that the government could or should do everything. One question. I'm very eager that we don't somehow let ourselves off the hook by looking to Russia as being the arch enemy in all of this. We're, we're here looking at lots of potential uh, players, uh, and I just don't want to get over obsessed with Russia. Uh, B Man, you had a, a, a supplementary about. I'd really like to know. Oh, I actually have to make an additional um, uh, declaration. I work with Luminet and Ben on occasion, and I have historically uh, a connection with um, Brunswick. So. Um, uh, I have an additional question, which is, uh, which is about uh, in an attention economy, where do commercial interests and the interests of, of bad actors actually coalesce? And, uh, uh, and, and what, could you unpick that a little bit? Please. I think that's a wonderful question. Um, interference. Does interference always have to be foreign? Does it always have to come from malicious actors? When we're looking at this attention economy, we are seeing that the type of information that we are labeling 
divisive information, disinformation, is often the information that is reaching most people. In fact, um, we have just um, at the Oxford Internet studied the UK elections. We've collected millions of tweets um, and millions of Facebook interactions. And what we saw there that while the spread of what we are calling junk news um, or disinformation is overall going down, we still see that individual pieces of junk news and of disinformation a widely outperforming professional news. So during elections here in the UK, um, users um, interacted much, much more with the junk news than they did with factual and professional information. And I think that's one of the important um, takeaways also um, that we should consider about today. Interference is not just foreign, but it is very widespread. <clears throat> Um, what we have seen is we saw many homegrown alternative news outlets um, that are propagating this information. Um, at the same time, we know that um, in Europe and in the US and many Western democracies, we now see parties and mainstream actors that are taking to very similar techniques, whether it's disinformation, whether it's deceptive campaigning, whether it is not disclosing campaign spending accurately, that is something that is happening in broad daylight. And I think right now in the UK, we do have <coughs> Good framework for regulation, but the framework is not fit for the digital context. Um, that starts, for example, when we are thinking about um, how is spending on digital advertising reported to the Electoral Commission. Um, we see we don't have those fine grain um, categories that we would need. Instead, we have one big lump sum category, digital spending. Uh, we don't know was it spent on Facebook, was it spent on Google, on Twitter, um, was it uh, spent on what kind of advertising? Was it one where uh, data was provided by the platform? Was it one where data was provided by a third party um, agency? So I, I think those are questions that we need to address when we want to make sure that our systems are fit for the digital age. Taking your catch th categorization, your three, we're talking about the, 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 lower, the lower one. Yes. Um, we were being told last week, for example, that BBC, the impersonation of the BBC online. Mm -hmm. impersonation of the Yorkshire Post and Sheffield uh, Star online. Mm -hmm. How seriously should we be concerned? And, and if our first line of defence, in a sense, is the Electoral Commission, how empowered should the Electoral Commission become? Thank you very much. That's, that's a really helpful question. And I wanted, on the previous question, simply to, to say, it, it's really, having been inside it, it's really problematic for a government to protect this area. And it's very notable when one sits at that green bay's table of the National Security Council, at the point at which you begin to talk about elections or electoral processes, suddenly everyone looks a little bit shifty <laughs> and uncomfortable because, because they're party pre, you know, they have to declare their interest as yes. you deal with it, which, which is why we need the focus uh, elsewhere and why it's so important that we steer it elsewhere, which is, of course, what we tried to do with the Oxford Commission. Um, I... What we found was that there's a set of bodies that have um, regulatory, either actual regulatory powers, as the, in a sense the UK Electoral Commission does, or have what I call uncertainty regulatory powers. In other words, they've got regulatory powers within the sector, and if they go and say, oh, it would be really nice if, the sector pays a little bit of attention to them because they've got real regulatory power. So I mean, there's a second category of ways in which people can act. And we found that there were some bodies there. They probably weren't staffed as they needed to be. They probably weren't funded as they needed to be. But critically, they were not animated as they needed to be because bodies such as this tend to be animated by government. So, so you know, if one thinks it's, it's government interaction with them which drives them along, and in this case, government doesn't interact because it stands back and says, oh, this is an election. We're elected uh, representatives. We can't really engage. So the, I think there's a, there's a, there is a, a problem with that which is why we need to stimulate uh, the behaviour of the Electoral Commission and some other bodies to take a more active role without direction from government, which is, a, you know, it should be that way, but it isn't. That's just the reality of it, and we need to make sure they're resourced. On the question of what an individual piece means, I remember a conversation with Google, um, who did a very good thing around uh, YouTube, uh, where they removed uh, a, a set of postings on YouTube which, which clearly had been generated by uh, the Russian state. Uh, and in those, uh, um, Russia Today product around 
the Scottish referendum, if I'm not mistaken, I need to go and check that, had been posted and rebadged as BBC, and they said, look at this. And, and you could have taken that and run forward with it and said, oh, look at this, the Scottish referendum is being undermined. I think there'd been some thousand, three or four thousand views of this, and the significant majority had been people who put it up checking that it was there. Mm -hmm. And almost nobody had seen it, and it was hard to say that it had had any significant effect on a significant number of people in, in the voting. And I think one of our difficulties is, we've, is that we need a mechanism that allows an independent body such as the Electoral Commission to make the judgment about whether the intervention is so severe that it has the kind of effect that misspending of funds has. If we look at the Electoral Commission, it can say, I'm sorry, this election in this constituency is no good, it's been ruined, we'll have to run it again, and you're disbarred. Or it can fine individuals but not cancel the election. But it does that on financial grounds. It doesn't do it on whether or not there has been some uh, 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 illicit, if you like, attempted interference. And I think that, that's where our difficulty is, is finding that threshold point. I think we have the way in which we judge whether or not in an individual constituency an election is unacceptable. We have a mechanism for that. It's just that we haven't loaded this task into it. Mm. Lord Lucas. I want to pick up on this point that uh, Mr. McGuinness has raised of the assessment of impact because it's the center of the problem. You cannot assess the impact. Let's take the Russians as one among many actors in the complex system that is fundamentally not driven by a logic of providing information to voters, but by a logic of providing audiences to advertisers. This is the commercial model that sits at the base of social media. So I'll, I'll, I'll use the example of what may happen today in Iowa, since it's fresh in the news. Not difficult to imagine that results are declared later today and disappointed losers and their followers begin to spread a conspiracy theory about hacking of the results tabulation in the Iowa caucuses. If it doesn't happen, I'd be surprised. That conspiracy theory might be motivated and generated by disappointed voters who have no connection to any kind of organized attempt to undermine the legitimacy of the American election. However, once it begins to take hold, it will become popular because conspiracy theories are popular. And under the logic of the journalistic commercial media system, editors, responsible editors, would not print a conspiracy theory that had no factual evidence underneath it. It would not appear on the front page of the Des Moines Register. It would not appear as a headline on the local broadcast television news in Iowa City, unless it was to debunk that conspiracy as false. Flash over to social media on YouTube or on Facebook or on Instagram or on Twitter, that conspiracy theory will go like wildfire. Why will it go like wildfire? Because the purpose of the editorial function in social media is not to provide factual information to citizens or even pretend to provide factual information to citizens. It is to get people to look at more ads. Whatever it is that gets you to look at more ads, that's what they're going to serve you up. If conspiracy theory about the illegitimacy of the Iowa caucuses sells ads, you can bet your bottom dollar that that is going to fly around social media at 10 times the rate of any kind of truth statement about any evidence underneath that. So then the Russians come along and all they have to do is nudge. Was the Russian intervention that amplified the conspiracy theory by 5% or 2% or 6% impactful? Was it definitive? Did it turn the tables? I don't know. No one can know. But we do know that this logic of, of, of the spread of disinformation for the purpose of monetizing advertising is a pernicious force. This is what we can determine for sure over the last several years. And what we know when we, when we begin to shine a regulatory light on it, how can we identify and, and remedy such a problem? We cannot, because we cannot see the data. We can only see the individual instances. We can see incident reports. Look, here's a screenshot of a tweet of someone spreading the conspiracy. Look, here's a YouTube video that YouTube took down because it was so obviously made by a bad actor. What about the 10,000 other pieces of content that have circulated? What about all the people who shared those innocently thinking that it was legitimate? 
Do we have the data to reconcile that as and, and assess its impact on the voting public? We do not. Do the companies have that data? They absolutely do. Why do we not have access to that data in any kind of oversight capacity? No other industry that has this kind of impact on the public would be able to say, trust me, everything is fine, don't worry. This is a fundamental issue that I think we have to get at when we're talking about how to assess the impact of the problem. Bobby. Following up on, on what Ben said, that's why it comes down to uh, involving the population. So uh, Stefan Zweig, if I may quote uh, the famous Austrian novelist, he writes in his, in his autobiography a, a sentence I think applies very much to, so it's about Vienna in the, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, and he writes, they drowse their lives away. And I think that very much applies to us today. So we lazily... Uh, spread that content that we shouldn't be spreading and yes there, there should be more regulation on the technology companies that that make money on it and 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 rather uh, unethically uh, help it spread but what if uh, we starved the, the problem of oxygen from the other side by um, empowering people by uh, educating them about the damage they do to to our own system uh, in whichever liberal democracy it is by sharing that information and uh, so if we starve it of oxygen from both sides, we have a, a, a very good chance, I think, of at least minimizing, if not eliminating, the problem. So twofold. One is, I, mean, I strongly agree with, with Ben that um, uh, transparency is the route through this. And it, it cannot be trust the companies, trust the political parties, trust the advertising industry, or indeed the media. It must be trust and verify. And that leads you on to the question of who are the verifiers. One, for me, one of the most disturbing aspects of the debate around the last uh, general election here, where uh, uh, an ISC, Intelligence Security Committee, report was not released, was everyone said, oh, it's dreadful, it hasn't been released. What kind of country are we if we need our intelligence agencies to tell us whether our elections are valid? It must be that non-state non organizations, they're fine organizations, but it must be that non-state organizations tell us, and non-state organizations such as those represented here tell us what is in the data uh, and what is happening there. I, you can see that I disagree with Ben about, about effect. I don't think we know what effect is had through this. Anecdotally, little effect is had through it, because whilst you know, conspiracy... Uh, conspiracy theories go wide, how they're read depends. Is it, is it believed or is it just, oh, look, there's a great story. Not true, of course. You know, there used to be, I remember, on the front page of the Observer, it was always very convenient before they had photographs because the top story was always the one that wasn't quite true. It was really convenient. You knew where it was. It's a very good story, but not true. You know, and that's certainly how I see my teenage children reading the Internet. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting question of where we put our effort do we put it into civics and critical reading of what's received or trying to restrict what is distributed, which may be finger in the dike stuff? Wait for the second question from Lord Lipsy. Sorry, please. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a bit of a paddyist on this one, I think. I was 40 plus years ago, I was special advisor in the Foreign Office, and they had a special department called the IRD, which was set up for the sole purpose of distributing anti communist propaganda, not approved by ministers, of course, around the world unattributably. I wouldn't say it had no effect. It had the effect of producing for the left of the Labour Party uh, an argument they could use to show the state was deeply anti any form of socialism. Otherwise, it was a complete waste of time and effort. And I suspect the same may be true of this. And I, I take the point that no evidence is not the same as something not being the case which has been made. But the fact is we haven't got, an, uh, all the academic studies show no influence on, on uh, voting behaviour um, and it's very implausible that it would have an effect on other things. It's a sort of Mr Putin's toy and for a little money the Russians can impress their president with their sophistication but there isn't much sign there's an impact. So I really wondered if anyone had any killing argument as to why I'm wrong. Um, if, if we were to wish to deal with this, are there any further propositions other than Paddy's that leave this to non-state organisations? Is there anyone who believes that we should have some sort of state or regulatory intervention 
to prevent or try to prevent this stuff. Yes, when we are thinking about impact, we are often talking about impact on the wider population. But often impact can be very narrow and it can be enough if um, a piece of disinformation, a certain campaign is convincing just a handful, even one individual. And I want to give a recent example which is disinformation around the coronavirus. Um, so the World Health Organization currently is actually cooperating with Google um, to bring out um, a couple of public health information um, about uh, conspiracy theories and disinformation around coronavirus. Um, the most popular uh, theories that have been spreading is that um, you can vaccinate yourself against coronavirus <coughs> by inhaling uh, sulfurous fumes from fireworks and um, that you can also use garlic in order to protect yourself from coronavirus, which obviously is very wrong. But um, so to stick with um, epidemiology, um, it's enough if one person believes that. If one person believes, okay, I can actually vaccinate myself um, by inhaling firework, first of all, um, that's gonna be a terrible health effect um, no matter what. But if that person then actually contracts the coronavirus, um, does not think he can get it and then spreads it, gives it on, then we have a very real world impact of a piece of disinformation. And I think that is also um, in this analogy um, where uh, we have a disease that is arguably fast, uh, spreading just as fast as disinformation. Um, it doesn't take a lot of people. It just, it's enough if we have one lunatic in Washington DC who thinks there is um, a pizza joint who's actually running a Hillary Clinton run child pornography ring and who goes into that establishment uh, shooting innocent people. Um, it's the same if we um, have just a handful of people that are believing, yes, they can vaccinate themselves against the coronavirus this way. And there's many other implications of that sort of disinformation stories where you don't have to have a range on the wider populace, but where if you have a couple of people that are really convinced, that then can catch on. Ben, ben and then Elizabeth. So. Uh, I'd like to take up the challenge from Lord Lipsy and argue that you're wrong, and that the reason you're wrong leads necessarily to a regulatory solution. Premise number one. You will never find evidence that a single piece of communication in the mass media has an influence on mass participation at the, voter, at the voting booth. Never in the history of communication study has anyone, anyone ever been able to prove quantitatively that there was a strong media effect from a direct transmission of one communication to one one small part of the audience it is the bane of the advertising industry's existence that they cannot quantify this. What they do know is if they stop advertising, market share declines relative to those competitors who do advertise. No one is quite sure why it is that certain communications end up causing attitude change in the public and others do not. The mystery and of how to quantify media effects has bedeviled communications researchers for decades. I studied uh, in my graduate school days at the Institute for Communications Research at the University of Illinois, which was set up by the CIA in the 1950s to do exactly the, the study of propaganda lobbed over the Iron Curtain. And they also came up with no compelling evidence that it was effective, and yet they continued to do it because they knew no other way to continue to influence the audiences that they were targeting. However, we're now living in an environment where in the theory of communications effects must be understood as systemic. It happens gradually and cumulatively over time. It is very difficult to measure, particularly in an environment where the average individual is consuming thousands of pieces of information every day, scrolling across their screens at the rate of several per second. Why is it that large chunks of our population believe in total fantasy, like the anti-vax conspiracy? Why is it that a large chunk of the American public continues to believe that Barack Obama was not born in the United States or that he's a secret Muslim? Why is it that we cannot solve any of our grand challenges of today, whether it is climate change or migration, because so many of our fellow citizens believe in things that are demonstrably untrue? And yet we cannot root those beliefs in any particular campaign of disinformation. We can only see systemically that it is having an impact. Point number two, 
if you speak to the experts in artificial intelligence and machine learning who are developing theory of the cutting edge of how data is processed in social media companies, they will argue with great confidence that not only is artificial intelligence that targets information at individuals to maximize their attention successful in maximizing their attention, it is successful in changing their attitudes and their views to make them easier as a target for maximizing attention. They are able to change the way people think to make them more inclined to look at extremist and conspiratorial content because that makes it easier to sell them more ads. Now, if either of my premises might be true, we have an obligation as a democratic society to try to find out. That is my argument. My argument is that if you believe that either of those things could be true, that all of the scientists in the AI field could be right, that social media has this kind of impact, but we cannot measure it without an extraordinarily careful study of the data, then we need to take one first step in the regulatory arena, which is we need to pry open the lid of the private sector's hoarding of data supply so that we can evaluate, so that researchers like those at the table on either side of me can look at that data and determine whether or not we can say one way or the other whether that impact is weak or strong. It may be that it has no impact at all, but the fact that we do not know and that it might have a strong impact and that credible experts believe that it does suggests to me that we must have a look. You're, you're contradicting me at all because I totally agree with you. We must keep looking at this stuff and uh, testing it to see whether it's effective and time alone will tell whether those of us who don't believe it's very compelling effect are right or those who believe that it has got a very serious effect. This isn't a disagreement. Yes, we will want to go on researching. But to do that research requires law because the companies will not voluntarily make sure. available their data. Sure. Elizabeth and Harry. Um, Lord, I, I think uh, I, I would agree with you, but, but uh, I think that the point of uh, the various interference attempts that may or may not, not have happened is not whether they were successful, to which extent they were successful, but uh, the perception of them happening and, and being successful. So if, if you're a foreign actor, or not even a foreign actor, a malicious actor of any kind, uh, if you can give the impression of interfering with another country's election, the work is already done, whether or not you are successful. And uh, that comes down to a point that was raised by uh, Lord Putnam, by your namesake, Robert Putnam, in 1999 in, in a book called uh, Bowling Alone, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And I think uh, uh, Professor Putnam was prophetic in pointing out the risks of uh, uh, decl the decline in civic participation because the more uh, atomized or fragmented societies become, the more likely we are to believe uh, negative things about our fellow citizens. And uh, while that was not the point he made in 1999, he just um, documented the extent of, of civic, uh, the, the decline of civic participation in the US, and of course the, the uh, trend is similar in other countries. Uh, that has now become, I think, a national security issue because it gives a, a new, provides a whole new front for, for countries that, and other malicious actors that, that want to weaken our societies. Thank you. Patty? I mean, three, three quick points. The first is, just to, just to cap off the thing about state actors. The thing about state actors is, is that the initial interference of this kind is just a slight indication of their overall intent. So if one thinks about where one's going to put one's effort, there is a national security effort to stop them at the gain line in this kind of activity so we don't find, as we did in 2016, them on 500,000 telephony routers for whatever purpose, Huawei and others, you know, to mess with our communication system. So, so that's an area of state competition, and that's the beginnings of their reconnaissance, and we absolutely should stop them on the gain line, and we should have the means to do so. Second thought is I absolutely agree with them that we're, we're not going to get to the place when, where the non-state can, uh, can manage this and we have true transparency if there isn't some regulation and law and there isn't some means of pressure. That certainly is true of the social media companies. I also believe it's true of the political parties where we need to understand what political parties are doing, not least to understand their intent. Particularly, as you raised earlier, there's the issue of funding. So if you begin to be concerned about not a state interfering 
through the data around an election, when the state interfering through the money around the election, you might be concerned in Germany, for instance, then you need to understand what the party thus funded is doing if it's doing something sinister. So I think that, that's vital. And the third one is, which I think Lisa uh, has made very clear is, I think it's now true that when we have a significant event, either a significant crisis or event, I'll give you two, coronavirus we've talked about, also COP26, we need to set ourselves, both government and non-government, to defend that against being delegitimized because there's a definite effort to do it and we need to do it by shining bright transparency on what people are doing around it so that we can have the proper discourse that Ben talked about to resolve the problems. Lisa Maria, that obviously begs a question. Pat has raised it and, and Ben's certainly raised it. How in a political system that we have in this country, um, when you've got non-provability of many of these issues, what, what levers do you use to get governments, that's the political parties, to, to accept the fact that they have to come up with legislation, which in a sense might be inconvenient to them. Is that a way of, Paddy, is that a way of re-expressing what you just said? Um, no, I think you're saying a different thing, but I think you're saying a valuable thing. I mean, I, I, it is, it I'll, is I'll, for... I'll settle for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lisa Maria. So, I think you are saying, do we have the data to actually say we do need regulatory intervention? In, 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 a, in a vacuum, in a data vacuum, which is what, what we're sort of looking at at the moment, whilst we understand the problem, I think Ben explained it extremely well, we understand the problem. How do you get political actors to take an important decision to legitimise politics when it could possibly be against their own self-interest? Well, I think on the one hand, we, of course, we have citizens, we have leading academics, we have uh, many people in government shouting on the top of their lungs that we do need more evidence, that we arguably are already in a moment of crisis um, where we're looking at social media, when we're looking at platforms. Um, so certainly also our report um, that we just published um, at in, in October um, uh, that we came up from um, our Oxtech uh, Commission on Elections and Technology. So for that report, um, we um, have interviewed um, several um, stakeholders um, at public agencies, at the ICO, at the Electoral Commission, um, also many stakeholders in civil society, from journalism to watchdogs um, to civic society organizations. And I think there has been um, a boggling agreement that uh, we don't quite understand social media yet. Um, there's many incentives that are coming together. Ben has very eloquently spoken about we have the advertising sector, which is a huge incentive, but we also have social incentives for people uh, to post dubious disinformation um, on social media. We have political incentives to do that. And we can see that many stakeholders in the UK and also around the globe are using that right now. Um, what we don't know, yes, is the impact. We also don't have a definite statement on the spread. And when we're looking at the spread, the data that researchers would like to have is just a public spread. So there is uh, much more of that kind of disinformation um, and other kinds of content that is spreading in non-public uh, groups, WhatsApp channels, WhatsApp groups, um, where this kind of content is still dominant. So I think uh, what we are trying to ask for really, and where um, everybody's looking at politics for help, um, is really just a tip of the iceberg to um, be able to get information from platforms which they are analyzing um, with questions like how well does our advertising perform to actually analyze it with questions about um, how should we protect democracy. Thank you very much, Dean. Third question from Barris Morris. Uh, Elizabeth, it'll come to you for sure. Um, it's clearly a very complicated area and you've talked already about what different parts of the system can do to try and solve the problem. So this is a question really about digital literacy. And where I was thinking was, within that context that you've already spoken about, what can we expect of the citizen um, in terms of you know, how, how big a role can they play if we get better at digital literacy? Um, and that's of course including the understanding and process of information. And do you have any examples of how this can be done or what might we be able to do to achieve it? What can be the extent of our ambition? You're absolutely right. And uh, again, I think the, the 
example from Latvia is, is excellent, where it's, it involves every teenager. And if I may give maybe a, a, an imperfect analogy, but if we remember the, the problem of uh, internet predators a few years ago, and, and it was a huge problem. I'm, I mean, you, you can't stop them from being on the internet and, and the police can do uh, uh, undercover stings and so forth, but, but the problem will persist. So instead, what was really successful was um, um, various levels of government and, and NGOs training uh, kids not to engage with suspicious uh, people online, and that has been hugely mm -hmm. successful, I think we can all agree. And so I think that's a... a, a as I said, maybe imperfect, but, but workable analogy for what can be done with democracy. We've got a, sort of a captive audience with, with teenagers and, and younger preteens even, who can be taught what sort of a malign activity goes on on the internet, not just from, from uh, internet predators, but, but from uh, hostile state actors. And, and when I look at uh, the, the curriculum in, in England at least, um, even though I know it's difficult to change, but PSHE, so my teenagers learn about body image and so forth. Why can they not learn about what other countries and other malign actors are doing to a country like this? And, and so once they know uh, what's happening and, and are equipped to uh, not uh, share uh, dubious information uh, without informing themselves, well, not to share information without informing itself, themselves about where it comes from and, and whether it's credible, uh, then uh, once they have that um, skill, they can uh, communicate it to their parents. So if we are to involve uh, society, school kids are just a, a very good uh, place to start. I agree, and I have, uh, in my role as a, a foundation officer, invested in digital literacy programs, experimental programs all around the world, looking at exactly how do we do this, because it's a nascent field. Uh, as one director of one of the best programs put it to me, he said, if you had an hour with every 16-year-old in the country to change how they think about social media and democracy, what would you say? Mm -hmm. What could you say that could possibly stick with them and that would give them something to take away out of the classroom that would change the way that they behave on the internet? That's a very, very difficult problem. It's one that will take a long time to work out. It will take steady interventions. But there are some interesting um, data points. Uh, Elizabeth pointed out uh, what's happening in, in Latvia. I think Finland is another interesting case that's often held up. The Finns essentially ran a public service campaign on every state-owned media channel that most of the private sector media channels got on board with, that it was the patriotic duty of every Finnish citizen to be able to tell the difference between truth and falsehood online because the Russians were coming for them. Mm -hmm. And that was a very successful campaign. Now, that's a small country and it was a very <clears throat> closed language market. They have very unusual geopolitics, but nonetheless instructive. But let me back out a, p a moment and, and suggest why we have such a big challenge and, and why I think it's hard for us who, who, who are not, who, who are socialized into the media system prior to the internet to understand what it's like to be a, a part of the digital native generation. When I talk to my children about this, I see it. 25 years ago, when you walked into a news agent at the airport, before you ever got close enough to the periodical rack to see what the titles were, you knew more or less what you were going to get. You knew because over here, the, the store is organized in a particular way. Over here by the registers are the daily broadsheets. They're printed on a certain kind of paper. The ratio of image to text is, 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 is a certain way. The size of the font, the, the flare of the headline will give you a sense of what kind of paper it is. You have a certain a set of associations with the brands and how hard they've worked to become uh, seen as quality or credible or right-leaning or left-leaning. When you go to the periodical wall, you know there's going to be, they're going to be divided by subject matter. And you're going to know before you pick something up, more or less what you're going to get, and then you're going to adjust your view based on what you're actually reading on the front page when you get it. Those are normative cues about quality and credibility that sort in your mind in advance of information consumption how to think about it and where to, prior, where to place it in your, in, your, in your hierarchy of credibility. Now. Think about Facebook or Twitter or Google search results or a series of YouTube videos that flow across your screen. 
They are all compressed into a single feed. They are all made to look the same. They're surrounded by a blue box. They are written in the same font. And in the moment that you consume it, you may notice that this story came from the BBC or that story came from the Daily Telegraph. But the next day, when you tell your friend what you read on, on the internet, they say, where did you see that? And you say, I read it on Facebook. Ah, oh, but you didn't read it on Facebook. You read it somewhere through Facebook. What was the source you read it from? I don't remember. Was it a quality source? Was it a credible source? No idea. That is how we lose our connection to the rudder of a common social understanding of what is factual presentation of the world around us that we share as a, as a society. And, and that, is, that is why we're seeing all this fragmentation and polarization. We have lost connection with a common sense of, of the world around us on which we can deliberate, compromise, and move forward as countries. I have a slightly more pessimistic um, outview over digital media literacy. And that's for two main reasons. Um, so first of all, um, when we are thinking about what is the digital landscape like right now? Um, we do know that we have artificial intelligence. Um, we have sophisticated fake material that is coming in. Um, we can produce automatically so uh, convincing video, convincing text in an automated way um, that looks very, very credible. And it's credible to the extent that it takes expert fact checkers um, several hours to a day to actually identify whether a video was fake, whether it was artificially generated. And now imagine you're asking your average user to do the same kind of thing. That's an incredibly big question. That's an incredibly difficult tool set that you need in order to assess that. So if you're thinking just about digital literacy, we're also putting a lot of onus on the citizen. And the second reason is that um, when we're looking into what is the kind of disinformation that is doing very well on social media, it's often not that sophisticated stuff. It is often the stuff that is very demonstrably false, that is a crazy conspiracy theory, where if you Google it, you already have um, a ton of debunking stories about it. Um, and even if you look into your comment section, a lot of people are saying, Obviously, this is not what is going on, um, but because we have something that is called confirmation bias. So people want to believe narratives that fit with their existing belief system. And if you have people that are already believing that the BBC, um, that the government, they are um, putting out disinformation, they are not to be trusted. And then if you read a story that fits right with that narrative, um, then this is exactly how this information is working. So I think when we are thinking about digital literacy, it's important not to just think about, it is about how people assess information and assess the quality of information. Um, but I think there's another door to it, which is cybersecurity. Um, so right now when we're looking into our curricula and also how the public is talking about digital literacy, there is not much room for cybersecurity. And with cybersecurity, what do I mean? I think it's very simple protocols, like for example, um, how to keep a password manager, how to make sure your communication online is safe. Um, that are relatively simple tools that are easily accessible that no matter what I think would make a big difference. And for example, when we are thinking about sort of the biggest um, disinformation uh, stories and impacts over the past couple of years. One of them definitely was the DNC and the hack of the DNC. And that is something that could have been easily avoided um, if um, we had password protected safe communication online. So it's not just for um, talking about how teenagers are um, getting information about social media, but it is very much also about um, how is the government um, using cybersecurity um, to an entry level um, of capacities um, when we're thinking about digital literacy. That has a supplementary, but Paddy, do you have anything you want to add before that? I wanted to talk about a slightly different kind of digital li literacy, and if you want to stop me, we can discuss it somewhere can, else. But I'll, can I pick up uh, Jim's question? Please do. Lord Knight, and I should say, because I'm afraid this is the first time I've spoken since the committee was reformed, so I need to declare my interest yes, um, in respect of my employment at uh, TES Global Limited, where we are a platform provider of user-generated content. Um, I was interested uh, in both what you were saying, uh, Mr. Scott, Ben, 
but, um, and uh, following on from what Elizabeth Braw was saying, um, you mentioned Finland, uh, where, uh, as I understand it from reading in the a media source that I choose to trust, um, the uh, uh, in schools they teach di digital literacy across the curriculum. They don't uh, try and squirrel it away in one little bit of a non-compulsory part of the curriculum. Uh, and uh, so in maths they would uh, teach around statistics and how you can use statistics to tell different stories as an example, or you, know, you, can, use, you can use digital literacy and history. You can, you can think across the curriculum how that aim. Do you think that's a better approach? And then there was a, an additional question around this, uh, the substantive point that, that you were both making, I think, then, which is, you know, when I look at Google's last major algorithm change in March, it was all around trying to ensure that search results uh, were prioritized according to their expertise, authority, and trust. And that, in a, yeah, in a way, it feels more credible that people at Google training their algorithms and then checking their algorithms at, uh, with humans will be better at differentiating fake than lay people, however educated. So how much can, should we be regulating and, in a way, trusting the likes of Google and picking out the best examples and the worst examples, and how much do we then rely on the citizen? I'll start. Um, I absolutely think that integrating digital literacy into existing curricula is the way to go. I, I've invested in both strategies, standalone courses that are modules that can be dropped in as piece parts that fit in between the gaps of other curricular studies, and I've invested in programs that attempt to integrate it into a, a multi-subject, <coughs> long-form module, and the latter is both more successful and more popular with teachers and students. More popular with teachers and students because they are not asked to digest new material from scratch that is unrelated to anything they've ever taught before. And what I've learned in, this, in the digital literacy space so far is that if you don't have the teachers on board, you've got nothing. Because ultimately, it isn't the digital literacy experts who go into the classroom day after day and talk to teenagers, it's the teachers who do that. And if they aren't able to do it comfortably, confidently, and effectively, it will fail. On the Google algorithm point, I would say, trust but verify is exactly the principle we ought to be driving at here. You know, imagine, for example, an, an adjacent industry which we're more familiar with that is equally complex and has an equally large impact on the public, the pharmaceutical industry. If the pharmaceutical industry said, we have new cancer drugs that we're rolling out onto the market, they are very effective. We have refined them to be more effective to reduce the side effects that our previous generation of cancer drugs had, and they are going to be a revolutionary benefit to the public. We would all say that's great. And now we want to have an independent scientific regulator, regulator go in and verify exactly what it is that's in the bottle that you're peddling to the people, and we need to have an independent review of its effects to make sure that what you're saying is accurate. And if it is, we'll all applaud and off we'll go and we'll deliver those drugs to the people and we'll get the benefits. But that regulatory piece is a critical part of what holds companies accountable and cuts against the commercial interests of those who would say one thing and do another. Elizabeth. Um, so following up on your question, and also your question there, Ms. Morris, um, another good example that I should have mentioned earlier is uh, the brochure that the, the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency put out in uh, May of 2018. I don't know if any of you have heard about it. It's called If War or Crisis Comes. And it's an uh, A5 size brochure uh, with bullet points about what to do in all kinds of crises. So uh, natural disasters, uh, gray zone attacks, uh, an invasion of Sweden. And, and it's very easily uh, accessible information that everybody can understand. And, uh, and it was sent out to every household in the country by post that you don't have to download it if the internet goes down, because then obviously you won't be able to download it. And so, but as a result, 75% uh, of those who received it read it. And I think that's, that's quite a, 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 an impressive figure. And on disinformation, has its, disinformation has its own page and uh, with, with bullet points including um, 
is the information where is the source from which you got the, the information trustworthy? In whose interest is it to uh, put out this information? And I think even small points like that make people think about whether they should be passing on information. Then another completely different example, uh, following up on, on ben, Ben's point about teachers. Uh, uh, so I'm an opera fan, and opera houses struggle around the world struggle to, re to, to bring in young people in scene. It's completely inaccessible, and why would you be interested in opera? The opera house in Warsaw uh, started an education program for teachers, for them to understand what opera is about, why it's relevant, and then they, they spread that information in their classrooms because they become converts. And uh, as a result, the, the Warsaw Opera House has phenomenal attendance. Every opera house struggles with attendance, but I was there recently, uh, a, a, an, an extremely avant-garde production. I had to leave in the interval, but there it was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but there it was, attended by lots of young people. And so, I'm, I'm not saying if we can do it with, with opera, we can do it with democracy, but... <laughs> <laughs> you get it. It's a great headline. <laughs> well, you can claim it. <laughs> Oh, let's have a quick follow-up. Um, from the examples you've given, and Ben gave one as well, I think they're excellent examples, and it, it's optimistic, and it shows that we can do things. So I'm, I'm absolutely with you on that. But one of the things that I worry about, it's not clear in my head, the examples you gave, there was an absolute consequence if the child got it wrong. So all children are aware what can happen uh, with people who will treat them badly if they meet them online and they can't trust them. Haven't we got to build the other bit? The thing that's worrying me is that I'm not sure how many young people will say this is really important because if I don't get this right, democracy is threatened. They've never lived in anything but a democracy. They've probably not got awareness of what's at risk. And we exist in a prevailing um, thought at the moment that our government's not very good and politics is broken. So is it the two... And I'm not... doesn't need a long answer, but it's... Is that a bit different than some of the examples you've given? I think that's the question. It is, and, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because, as, as you will have heard, the Cambridge Centre for the Future of Democracy uh, released this extremely interesting and, I think, quite depressing report uh, a few days ago. And so in the UK, it, it shows that the, the, the percentage of people dissatisfied with democracy that's right, that's right, yes. is at a record high, so 61% uh, just before the last election. Yeah. And that's up from 33%, so an, <coughs> an almost 100% increase in, in, in less than two decades. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because people have no idea what it's like not to have, have democracy. democracy. We, are, we yeah. have been spoiled <laughs> having, by having democracy. We don't know what it's like not to have it. And it's, it's like good health. You don't appreciate it until you no longer have it, and then it's too late. And if I may make a radical suggestion, it is that all around us, uh, we have people who have experienced uh, authoritarian uh, regimes or dictatorships. They live all around us here in the UK and other parts of Europe. They are the, the best possible resource we have for everybody to find out what it's like not to have democracy anymore, uh, because obviously we wouldn't want to experiment with lack of democracy ourselves. Mm -hmm. What if uh, some part of, of the government or local governments were to bring in these people, uh, survivors of the, th the Third Reich, um, people who live behind the Iron Curtain, so that ordinary people around the country could listen, could hear from them what it's like not to live with democracy. And I think that would make it uh, all the more clear to them just uh, the danger. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't bring it to the, down to the personal level of what can an inter internet predator do to me, but it would uh, no, it make it makes much link. clearer to yeah. them what is at stake. You've been very so, patient. Uh, <clears throat> Um, I wanted to, to touch on another aspect of digital uh, literacy, which is, I think, relevant to what Elizabeth has just been saying. So, um, well, um, no disrespect to the legislature, and I have been, you know, working for the executive, and, um, but we tend to be 10 years behind the curve mm. of what is needed in a technology. So, you know, exactly. 10 years after... Facebook really bursts out into the scene. We have you know, consideration of an internet safety uh, piece of legislation in the Queen's speech, you know, yeah. 10 years later. Yeah. Um, and um, I think Elizabeth's absolutely right about talking about uh, the way in which um, perhaps democracy is affected. A democracy is affected by 
um, political movements, but it's also affected by technology. It is affected by technology, and there's no denying it. Um, and so for me, when we think about digital literacy, there is a, a thing which I call the technology risk. I wish I could find a better word than risk. And that is that I think the healthiest companies, and every company now has a dependency on data or enabling technologies, considers regularly what the changes in technology mean for its business model. And it seems to me if we're going to have a conversation as we are today about what we do about democracy, about elections and democracy, Ben has made this point, I think, for us. We mustn't just make it on the basis of what we can see in the rearview mirror. We've got to have a way of doing it that is able to accommodate the changes in the available technologies. Because even though we can argue about whether artificial intelligence and deep fakes will have profound effect in the next two or three years, it's very hard to argue what technology will be doing what to us in the next 10 years and where we'll have got to with a whole range of other technologies which will bring to bear information in a different way. So I think the thing about digital literacy is, is we've got to have a space where we talk about the effect that technology is having on our societies faster. Yeah? And, and that's a real challenge for those of us who are not digital natives and those of us who aren't close to the technology industry and aren't paid to do this all the time. But it seems to me that that is... And that then feeds into what does your teacher say to your, the children? Or what does the teacher say to the children? That's got to be informed by the technologies that are ahead of the children, not that are behind them. Mm. Personally, I've found that my children are actually have been incredibly well supervised and I, I'm really pleased with the way in which they interact with what I call the ephemeral internet, which um, is the, the internet they tell me they cannot live without. I kind of know that that, you know, and the way they interact with that, I'm really pleased by, but I can see that that's going to be dated by the time they're 25 or 30, and, the, uh, and it'll be somewhere else. So I think the digital literacy point for all of us, not just for bringing young people through. The, the, a challenge for us is you're absolutely right, there's at least a 10 year uh, lag between understanding or what's going on. But the problem is there's also at least a five year lag in, in politically implementing what might be the kind of regulation that uh, could, could solve things. And our job really is to try and short circuit that five year lag. That's what we're trying to do. And, and I've, I think one of the aspects of what Elizabeth raised about educating people about the implications of not living in a uh, democracy is that what you, you do then is you come to fear the state. So what happens is you educate about what authoritarian states do and you say, we mustn't have the state interfering in these arenas in which we live out our democratic life, i.e. online. And that's why this question of transparency, and not just transparency about what is published, as Lisa rightly said, it's not just what is put into the public domain, it's also the mechanisms that are used and the more hidden areas that need to be transparent to non-governmental actors which help you make the case for the kind of regulation and legislation that you need. Because if you're doing it, and it's frankly done by the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, it is the state doing something to the people. Right, we're slipping a slightly bit of time here. Mike, John. Well, surprisingly, throughout the whole of the discussion, um, uh, referred to the question which I wanted to ask you, which is about the role of civil society act, non-state actors in creating a resilient uh, society. Um, so I'm going to, you know, you've ranged from uh, shouting from the top of, of your voices to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, uh, to, to uh, doing uh, education and, and, uh, and I would like you, if you would, to prioritise what you think the role of civil society non-state actors should be in developing and helping and support a resilient democracy. So you've already identified lots of things. Which ones would be the top of your agenda? Otherwise we'd be in trouble. So in our um, Oxtech report that came out in October, we actually identified three things where we, can, where we think civil society can do something right now. Um, we think one of the things is that um, we need to look at civil society to work with the data that's available um, through the public domain, through, um, for example, Facebook's advertising archive, Twitter and Google have similar efforts. Um, so to actually work with that publicly available data, um, look into what is going on over social media. 
And then second, um, again very related to that, is to identify what the type of data is that we would need and to advocate for it. Um, we already just established that we will probably have a five-year lag uh, for any sort of regulation to come in. But there is also, uh, as platforms like to say right now, self-regulation, um, where uh, we have platforms that are coming forward with um, certain amounts of data um, with transparency information, with transparency reports, but what we're seeing is that um, often, whether it's an advertising archive or whether it's a transparency report, um, the categories how things are reported are too broad and are not really helpful. They're not helpful for research, they're not helpful for civil society organizations. Um, that is, for example, um, because a Twitter or a Facebook, um, they have a transparency report of what kind of information they're taking down and how much information that is, but then they're not reporting, was it um, information um, that got taken down um, because it was illegal speech? Was it taken down because it was against their own terms of platform service? So to lobby for that kind of information and advocate for it, um, I think is right now a very important role of civil society because they are very much um, the actors that we are looking um, to navigating um, that dialogue right now that needs to happen now and does not need to happen um, in five years. Thanks, Ben. I'll simply agree that research and education are top of the list. The, the best um, empirical analysis of what's happening in digital disinformation is happening in research universities around the world and they need resources and they need more data in order to do even more of that kind of work. It's, it's pulling back the curtain on this surveillance commerce that has begun to dominate our information markets. Second is, is education, and then this reprises our theme of how do we train more teachers to give them the tools that they need to go into the classroom and educate students about how to understand this phenomenon and, and how to conduct themselves in that space. The third thing that I would put on the list is is a kind of uh, movement building around how do you change people's attitudes about what they imagine digital media should be, what they expect from the companies that deliver products and services in that market, and what they demand is available to them as citizens in a democracy. And I think we have become conditioned to accept that the digital media landscape will be dominated by two or three companies. Why is that? It wasn't like that even five years ago. Ten years ago, if I had been sat in front of this committee, I would have been arguing about what a fantastic force for democratic good the internet is in the world. I did that for the Obama administration. It just was not that long ago that the internet was considered by and large a force for progress. And so what, what, what's gone wrong has gone wrong recently and it is in my view, most likely to reverse itself. We are most likely to see that five, ten year lag in government response and market change begin to turn when we see people demand better. And people will only demand better if they imagine that it's possible and they're given leave to expect better from the companies and the governments that are determining how the market behaves. Okay. And that's something we can all play a part in. We also let them know what better would look like. Daddy, very briefly. Uh, so I'm a philosopher. Civil society. No, no, I'm a philosopher's son, so I, th I put it to you like this. I think we need to enable civil society to tell us what is the case, because we can't rely on Google to tell us what is the case, and many people feel you can't rely on the state to tell you what is the case. So you need a setting based upon empirical data where it's possible for the kind of institutions that are sat here to say to you, we've looked at this data and this is the case. And then you can rely on that, which you cannot rely on fully from any other source, I'd suggest. Thank you very much indeed. Elizabeth, last word on this one. A bit strong, really. So civil society obviously includes um, entrepreneurs and would be entrepreneurs. And in a previous life, I was a technology correspondent based in San Francisco. And I can't tell you how many times I was surprised at a sort of really uh, quite a marginal uh, products that these uh, very brilliant guys came up with. So some guy had discovered there was no parking in San Francisco or no hotel room, so they invented an app for that. Well, I, I think if, uh, if these hugely brilliant young men and women were to understand the extent of 
and the threat to our democracy that technology poses, we wouldn't just have three companies. We would have lots of new companies that would try to address that. Who knows how successful they would, they, they would be, but at least we would have a, a larger number of companies out there, and, it, and at least hopefully some for good. Um, so I think there, there's a, um, an opportunity to, to educate uh, these uh, hugely uh, talented uh, entrepreneurs and would-be entrepreneurs about what sort of things are needed so that they don't invent more parking apps that are, will hopefully no longer be needed anyway because we'll move away from, from, from a car-based culture. Um, then a second thing is um, the role of, of newspapers. So uh, uh, a number of years ago I, I was at, uh, a fellow at uh, the Reuters Institute at Oxford um, uh, looking at uh, the, the growing divide between the public and the, public, uh, and the political media elite. And, and one of the ideas that came out of that research was that newspapers should have surgeries just like, like MPs do. MPs put themselves at the disposal of the public, tell them uh, what it is they do and the public can ask questions. The public can't ask newspaper editors question, and questions and as a result they, they get suspicious about how the news media operates. And it, would be, it wouldn't be a complete answer, but imagine what sort of divide we could bridge by having uh, citizens interact with journalists. And uh, I think as a result, they would trust mainstream media more and resort less to, to uh, conspiracy feeding outlets that are definitely harming our democracies. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, next question, if I might, Mike, you're happy with? I'd love to have that conversation a bit longer because one of the things about the, the, the key issue for me is if you take the figures you've raised, but that's well, how do we raise 33 from 60 back to 61 percent again? What are the what's the actual you know the first thing that you would do to make sure that lifts up? Can I use that as the last as the, as the final question? Yes, yeah, sure. I realise right. that's why. Right. Rafe, uh, well, to, to be annoying and to pick up on what you just said. Uh, what experience have you of the likes of Delib and Citizens.is? Uh, it seems to me that them working in successful local digital democracy gives people a taste for it. It's something that newspapers could use to, for interaction with their readers. Have you seen anything like that? And if we can't go the positive direction, uh, what would, how could electoral law and the role of the Electoral Commission or other regulators be changed to give us better protection? As an answer to your first question, uh, the only example I'm aware of so far is something that Der Spiegel in Germany started last year, where they actually started running surgeries like, uh, like what I've just described. And so it would be interesting to see, uh, hear from them what the results are so far. Mike's question. Ben? I'll make two quick points. One is I think investing in deliberative civic organizations at the local level is critically important. I can tell you from, uh, from the perspective of a foundation, there's simply not enough money in, this, in the sector. There are a number of really promising experiments happening in different countries around the world, but they're tiny. And the number of people that they engage is too small to have a macro impact on, on public perception. In terms of regulation, there's, there's one issue I want to raise before we conclude, which I'd be remiss if I didn't. We've been talking about all the most difficult problems of, of both measuring and managing the problem of digital disinformation. We haven't yet talked about the simplest things we can do. In the security terms, we should lock the front door. We should regulate political advertising on digital media. This is very easy to do. It is clear how to do it. There is no mystery about <laughs> why it needs to be done, and yet we haven't done it. And the consequences, while they haven't been severe in the short term, they very well could be. There is no reason in the world why we cannot force all the companies that sell political ads to make them obviously visible as political ads to any reader. There's no reason why they can't do that in real time. There's no reason why they can't disclose after the fact how much was paid for that ad, who bought it, who was targeted with that ad, how many people it reached, and so that everybody is aware of what's happening in terms of paid political communications. That's not being done. Just in the last election, three days before the vote in December, Facebook had a glitch, and their self-regulated, publicly available ad database went offline for 36 hours, three days before the vote. They offered no explanation. They offered no apology. 
They just shrugged. Nobody did anything. We should lock the front door. Lisa Maria. To add on what Ben said, here's also a role for political parties. Um, political parties, of course, also could disclose what kind of advertising um, are they putting out online. It doesn't have to be that it's just a Facebook and the Googles that have an advertising archive for digital material, but it could also be the parties. Um, parties are already um, archiving their non-online campaign material, so why not extend that to the online material? And I think the second thing that I would want to push for um, is um, political campaigning is not a thing anymore that just happens during election season. It is very much a year-round, year-long effort um, where we have um, parties, but we also have um, other forms of campaigners where we also have, um, of course, the big farmer and oil companies that are um, putting out political advertising over social media. So I think to rethink that and then also to accordingly rethink, for example, uh, the role of many regulators here in the UK, many, also the Electoral Commission, for example, um, is a consequence um, that we should draw. Very much. What I'd like to do is wrap up Lord Luce's question and uh, Lord German's question in a final question, because you may be able to pull this in. If the government could do just one thing to improve the resilience of our democracy in a digital age, what would it be? And I'm afraid we do have to keep it pretty short. Paddy, what one thing would you like to say? I'm, I'm torn because I've got two. Okay. Um, You're allowed. Yeah, thank you very much. So today, I mean, so... We did a whole load of work on this, and we've produced a report which we'll submit uh, with a set of recommendations which are very specific and were designed to be available to the United Kingdom in 2019, and very specific things you can do. But broadly speaking, I'd say two things. One is that they, they could regulate about, they could regulate and also use existing regulation to drive the availability of data for transparency so that you had the reflecting mirror of non-governmental organizations and academia, so you really know what is the case. First thing. The second thing is that we could that we could galvanise existing institutions that we have. And we've talked about the Electoral Commission, but there are others that have a role, including incidentally the police service. When one gets into more criminal areas, and and the thing about it is, when we looked at it, all of these bodies have a potential role in protecting democracy, but they aren't terribly active in it because there isn't animus at the core of it. So there's something about how do you animate that group who meet informally and make them meet and act formally, conscious that they are protecting democracy, but not as a function of the executive. It's a bit of a challenge, but it's what I'd want. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Dean. Lisa Maria. Um, to put it very bluntly, is to um, make the frameworks that we have fit for the digital context. I think we have good frameworks, we have um, good regulators, um, we do have many existing um, regulations around elections and democracy, around political campaigning, but now we need to look how can we make them fit for the digital context, and that includes political advertising on platforms, that includes how information is spreading over social media, and also the scale. I think scale is one of the very important things that we need to think about. We have millions of pieces of information that we see over social media, over the internet every day, and for that we need new approaches about how we can think about them, how we can monitor that, and and um, how can the government have a role in this process? Ben, and before you answer, just mention, I wrote on behalf of the committee to uh, the cabinet secretary immediately before the election, asking what action the government would take in the event of a contested election in Britain. And there really wasn't an answer. It is pretty clear to me that uh, we don't have a, a, a policy or a, or a process which is quite extraordinary. So in answering your question, the last one, and with Iowa in mind, what one thing would you like to see us do? I could say many things, but I would argue that all roads lead back to one, which is audit. Public must have the ability to audit those industries that control the flow of information to the society that are opaque and held proprietary by a small number of companies that are more powerful than any in the history of the media system in the world. We must be able to audit it. We must be able to send in expert researchers who are independent of the company and review exactly what's going on in those systems and how influential they are in spreading 
to disinformation of foreign operations, in hiding the flow of dark money in our elections, in propagating the organized effort to deceive and promote inauthentic content to an unsuspecting public. All of these things can only be measured and ferreted out and eliminated through oversight, and oversight requires audit, mandatory access to data. Thanks very much, Stephen. Elizabeth, last word. So unlike Ben, I think all roads lead to citizen engagement, even though I, I don't dispute what you said, Ben, but uh, so all roads lead to citizen engagement. And the first step I would like to see is, as pedestrian as it may sound, a brochure like what the Swedish Civil Contingencies Agency put out, but with a title, Why Election Security Matters to You. And once equipped with that information, I think most people uh, would have a better understanding of why elections are not, uh, or in fact democracy as such, is not a, a, an abstract concept, but actually about them, in, uh, uh, it's concerned with them directly and in fact relies on their active engagement, then based on that one could follow up with, with various uh, forms of engagement, including um, bringing in uh, people who have experienced them or lived through uh, dictatorships in authoritarian countries. But it starts there, and um, I think it would, it, it would get some thinking going among people who are, are in that 61 per cent who are dissatisfied with democracy already. Well, thank you all very, very much. You've been very patient. Your evidence really is absolutely hardcore to what our committees have held. So I'm sorry if we've overrun a bit, but it's worth it, certainly from my point of view, and I'm sure the committee share the same view. Thank you very much indeed. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 The proceeding is currently suspended.
The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. The proceeding is currently suspended. And uh, welcome to the committee. Sorry about the slight flapping around there, but uh, that's the nature of committees. Um, I have to make a formal statement to begin with, which says, as you all know, this session is open to the public. A webcast of the session goes out live and is subsequently accessible via the parliamentary website. A verbatim transcript will be taken of your evidence and put on the parliamentary we website. You will have an opportunity to make minor corrections for the purpose is of clarification or accuracy. Is that okay? Okay, first question, Lord Black. Thank you. Um, I want to start, if we can, with the question of the information that the public should have access to about political campaigns. It was something we were actually touching on at the end of the last session. We all know the public has limited attention for these matters, and it probably has limited knowledge um, about detailed digital uh, issues. So from your point of view, what are the most important aspects of political campaigning about which the public should be made aware? And you can look at a number of different areas if you want money, in other words, where the money is coming from, what it's being spent on, data, um, what campaigners know and how they know it, and then speech, in effect, what is and isn't an advert. Whichever of you wants to kick off. I can kick off. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think that's a really important question because it gets to the heart of transparency. And I think you can also look at it in the sense of who is providing that information to the public. So one of our concerns in terms of what the public, uh, who the, what information the public has access to is that it really is important that an individual, if they want to know, um, has information that explains to them why they're seeing a particular message. So that really requires that it's clear what sources of data were used to target that message at them, and that the full targeting criteria is available um, as to why that message was targeted at them. They should also have information about how to exercise their rights and how to prevent such targeting. And they also should have access to information about the cost of that targeting. But we also need information and transparency from other actors, uh, such as political parties, um, about the tools and services they're using, the companies they're contracting with for what services, and for what cost, uh, the messaging that they're using, and again, that granular information about the data from the sources to what they're doing with the data, to who, who they're targeting, under what criteria, and also the campaign groups and third parties that they're affiliated with. And then again, in terms of the companies, we need much more information uh, about how they're targeting information that's not ads as well, in terms of pushing content and recommendations. And all of this information must be available in a persistent and continuous way because we need information available to us as individuals, as voters, but also for the further study of this information so that others, including civil society, academics and um, journalists, have, have access to this because transparency is also a tool for accountability. Hi, I'm Pascal Cram, the Data and Democracy Project Officer at Open Rights Group. Um, in terms, first of all, of what kind of information the public should have access to, I think then there should be a wider recognition and a kind of information push to ensure the public understand that 
this problem of data-driven political campaigning is not solely limited to the use of uh, political ads on social media, um, and that in many ways political ads are the end of a production line um, that begins with electoral roll data taken by the political parties, which is mixed with sources of commercially available data, such as, say, Experian uh, credit history information, that is then uh, processed and turned into a profile that is then used as a basis upon which to start um, you know, uploading to Facebook, uh, mixing with uh, social media, information on social media, and then that gets uh, turned into ads that are served and being targeted. Um, second of all, um, I think there needs to be a wider understanding amongst the public that you know, social media platforms themselves, they are not the sole arbiters of our democracy. Um, political parties bear you know, really significant responsibility in this as well. You know, they are the, they're the customers. They're providing the initial sources of data and data profiles. Um, and really, it's quite difficult, obviously, to expect political parties to regulate against their own, their own interest. But in many ways, responsibility lies at their door as much as it does social media platforms, if not more. John. Um, well, the question of political campaigns, transparency is really fundamental to democracy and um, covers many issues. Um, so while Mozilla would certainly support strong transparency requirements in all actions by political campaigns, our work this year has been, um, and like our remar my remarks today, are going to be focused on online political advertising transparency. Um, I'll reinforce the point that Ailey has made about um, uh, disclosure to users on the platforms and um, clear labelling obligations, uh, including why users are seeing ad ads, I think um, is an essential part of this. But while user transparency is good, it's putting too much pressure on um, an ordinary person, you or I, to protect ourselves online. Um, so we, we advocate for an obligation on relevant platforms to disclose all political and issue-based ads. Um, and publicly available ad archives. Uh, these archives should generally include information about the advertiser, how much they spend, and any information available to advertisers themselves. More specifically, there are several pieces of information that we think are absolutely critical to making these archives successful. First, these repositories should include the advertiser's targeting parameters. This is necessary to understand how information flows across these platforms and can be disclosed without any substantial privacy risk. Platforms have thus far been unwilling to disclose this information, and we don't find that their arguments against the disclosure are particularly compelling. Secondly, it must include all demographic information about who is seeing and clicking on ads. This information could pose some privacy risk if disclosed incorrectly, but to avoid this risk, disclosure obligations should focus on providing aggregate high-level statistics about protected classes and demographics. And thirdly, the government should seriously consider requiring all ads to be disclosed, not just a narrow class of political ads. Focusing on political ads allows adversaries to game the system to avoid disclosure, and it puts platforms in the untenable position of deciding what is a political issue ad. digital literacy and education point, I think everybody here would, would agree with what Pascal said. On, on the access to data and disclosure and user transparency, uh, the question is how it's done and who does it. Um, uh, and there are a number of bodies in this area, the most obvious of which, of course, is the Electoral Commission. But there is also, and we've heard evidence from the Advertising Standards Authority uh, relating to their possible role in this. I was just wondering how you thought we could best go about this, whether the existing bodies could be made to have the power to do it, or whether it's going to need a new form of uh, system of regulation, which would, of course, require legislation, and that's not going to be quick. Sure. Um, in the uh, upcoming duty of care for online harms um, bill, uh, it should include a code of practice for online targeting. and. Um, and any new regulator should require full ad transparency as um, in a way to address targeting practices. Could I just add to that? I think I would add to that that I think the focus should be on the implementation and enforcement of uh, some of the existing frameworks as well as updating them. So in terms of transparency, this is a requirement of data protection law as it stands. 
And there we have some mechanisms to make this meaningful. So I think enforcement of data protection law is key to, to all of the questions that the committee are, are looking at. And how do we make that transparency more granular and mandate it? And I think there, for example, the ICO code of practice that is, is currently in draft is, is one tool, for example, but that should be made a statutory code so that that transparency can, can be mandated. And then, um, as well as making that principle a, a reality, so mandating transparency for the different actors in, involved in political campaigning, then also looking to electoral law and the uh, disclosure requirements there in terms of the, the detail of transparency about campaigning activities. John, can I ask you one favour? You mentioned um, that uh, non-disclosure disclosure by the big, the big corporates is uh, an issue, and you regard it as uh, their arguments as not being particularly valid. It would help the committee, I think, a good deal to understand what your counter-arguments are, because this is a battleground, obviously, and I'd love to be able to get my head around the, the why, in fact, the companies are hiding behind uh, uh, privacy, privacy considerations, when, in fact, they're not really valid. Um, it's important on transparency on political ads um, that we shouldn't stop at how users are being targeted by advertisers. So a recent study from Northwestern University in the United States showed that Facebook's algorithms can dramatically skew the delivery of ads. So even if the advertiser didn't intend it. Um, that's why it's quite critical to analyse both the potential reach of a political ad, so that's the criteria chosen by the advertiser and how much the advertiser spent, but who that political ad actually ended up reaching. And that's a function of the platform's algorithm. So that's why we're um, advocating for those disclosure obligations. Sorry, but by penetrating the, the algorithm, how much commercial damage would we collectively be doing to the company's potential? I, I don't think um, increased transparency through a comprehensive ad archive will fundamentally undermine the business okay. model. Okay. Just to follow that up, my understanding is that the Cambridge Analytica uh, scandal, whatever we choose to call it, um, came about in part because of the tr researchers being able to access Facebook data and, and to some extent understand the algorithm better. Is that a risk that we, as, it, as transparency increases the understanding, bad actors then understand how to circumnavigate uh, and exploit the, the platform? I think Cambridge Analytica is a, an example of only partial transparency. Um, advocating for full transparency can have the opposite effect. So as uh, Pascal was talking about data being a supply chain. So as the food and fashion industries are being transformed by transparency into their supply chains, for example, we now know that children aren't stitching our shoes. Um, we need to look at transparency in this case as a means to an end. It's to help us identify the intervention points to make the entire system stronger rather than the thing that we're aiming to achieve in the first place. Baroness Control. Um, so my question is somewhat narrower, and I accept that it sits in the bigger case that you all have just made, but uh, last year in May, the government committed to introducing digital imprinting by the end of the year. Um, we had an election, it didn't happen, and we haven't heard anything yet post-election about what they exactly intend. But I think... And I, I accept, John, you, you've answered some of this, but I would love to hear from you. What should digital imprint, what features should it have? Absolutely. And also ad libraries in order to be useful. And I was really interested in your point that, um, you know, where the boundary is between a political ad and not an ad, and, and whether you think imprinting actually is an effective tool beyond political advertising. Maybe you could start, John, because you said quite a lot about this, and then we'll move on. Sure. Um, my answer is going to focus on um, on ad libraries themselves, mm -hmm. as uh, they were the centre of our advocacy campaigns in 2019. Um, regarding digital imprints, we don't yet have a detailed position at this point, um, but the key transparency requirements that 
I sort of mentioned earlier um, could be a good start. On the ad libraries specifically, um, Mozilla, along with 10 other researchers, helped create uh, a set of guidelines that lay out minimum standards for what an ad library or ad API could look like. Um, for us, it would include comprehensive advertising content. Um, last year, we are focusing in on political content, but the, as I mentioned, there's an argument for all content, advertising content to be included in there. Um, uh, the content of the ad itself and information about that targeting criteria that I mentioned. Um, so that could be the text, image, or video content and information about where the ad appeared. Uh, the targeting criteria used by advertisers to design the campaign, but then who the ad actually reached. Um, it also needs to include the functionality to empower and not limit researchers and to be able to do analysis. Uh, so that would mean that each ad needs to have a unique identifier associated with it and allow the advertiser to allow for a trend analysis over time. Um, all images, videos and other content need to be in a machine readable format accessible via, via some kind of programmatic interface. Uh, we need to, the ability to bulk download data um, for all relevant content and search functionality by the text of the content itself. And uh, we also need up-to-date and historical data access. So that would mean the availability of ads within 24 hours of publication, um, ability to search for ads going back 10 years, and the tools that researchers can use are promptly fixed when they're broken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, um, and then, most crucially, public access. So the, any tool um, and any data collected from that tool should be accessible to anybody in the general public. Um, I think it's also important to note that we assess Google and Facebook's ad archives um, according to these guidelines that I've just outlined for you ahead of the 2019 European Parliament elections. Google's tool, their ad API, met four of the five minimum standards but with a few important omissions. Namely, there was no information on that targeting criteria, which is so vital, and nor does the ad API provide engagement data, so clicks, essentially. That targeting and engagement data is critical for researchers because it lets them see what types of users and advertisers are trying to influence and whether or not those attempts are successful. Um, Facebook met only two of our five minimum standards. Like Google, they fi failed to produce targeting and engagement criteria, but it's also impossible to determine if they're providing comprehensive ad data uh, because of the current ad API design, um, uh, which is putting huge constraints on researchers. Um, for example, search rate limits, or the fact that a lot of the time the archive didn't work at all. Yeah. Um, and these findings were highlighted by the New York Times last year. Um, and backed up by conclusions made from a similar study by the French government. I would just add to, to what John has said in terms of, of what's required in those ad libraries and the current deficiencies that there are and much more information is required in terms of the ads that are there but also ensuring that more ads are captured within those archives and it, I think also just noting that the platforms are a piece of the picture and there are many tools and, and, and ways that we can be targeted with messaging so we this is an important step but it, it cannot be the only one and has to be seen as part of that wider picture um, and that's where ensuring transparency from other players is important including political parties and for example we um, and other civil society organizations wrote to all the political parties in the UK in advance of the December election asking them for transparency and clear ten, 10 clear points which link back to data protection law and electoral law but none of them were forthcoming none of them were were uh, proactive in their transparency in terms of how data is use used and how they're conducting their campaign. So I think um, we really need to work on improving the ad libraries, ensuring that they include all of the ads and that they include all of the information that we need. But we also need to think about that wider picture and transparency from all of the actors as well. Pascal. Um, 
Thanks. Um, I think all I would add is that the Electoral Commission have been calling for digital imprints since 2000 and f since 2003. Um, it's frankly quite incredible that we've got to this point without any kind of parity, at a minimum parity, between online and offline political yeah. ads. I'm just curious that neither of you mentioned political the imprint itself. Is that because you think it's useless or because you actually, it's a simple matter? I'm just curious that you didn't mention it. I think that it's, in, in this case, it's really important to listen to the regulator and, and the regulator is, is, is an expert in, in this and as a minimum, the regulators must get the, the resources and the recommendation and the, what they're calling for, but that will only be a tiny step in what is the bigger picture. So it is one thing that, that should and, and can be considered, but we need to think more wisely than the imprint. Thank you. Very much indeed. Lord Jonathan. Can I ask you whether there's a case in your view uh, for extending the current 12-month regulated period before a UK general election, um, uh, and if that was the case, then would you counter that with the costs which would fall upon those bodies, and that would include political parties, who would, who would have to find the necessary funding because there would be the cost to doing that if, if, if you extended it beyond 12 months? And remind me, this only occurs in UK general elections, not to other general elections in the UK. Um, if, I, if I may, um, I think, <coughs> yes, absolutely, there is a case for that. Um, and part of the reason for that is that so much of the, the data gathering uh, and the preparation of the campaign uh, happens outside of the regulated period. Um, and we really need a way to make sure that we can, uh, the regulators in particular, can hold political parties to account over their use of personal data and the value that that might bring to their political campaign and the ways it might help them to save money in other areas of their campaign. Um, so, for example, we have proposed that the political parties, sorry, that the, the regulators be able to um, conduct not just kind of joint data audits to make sure that outside of the regulated period that parties are abiding by spending limits on the data that they uh, accrue, but also that during elections um, they should be able to kind of conduct raids or, or like drug tests essentially as you see in the Olympics to make sure that political parties are, are abiding by the spending limits as they stand. Um, sorry, come on. Um, that was... Excuse me. I was just going to add that I think when we talk about elections we talk about the electoral cycle and I think there's recognition that the electoral cycle doesn't stop and start <coughs> within, within that narrow period and it's the entire cycle and I think that we need to to change uh, regulation to, to reflect that. And what digital campaigning and the changes we've seen does enable is almost a permanent campaign. And so looking beyond that restricted period is essential. And in terms of the, the question of, of, of setting that with the, the costs, for example, I think we need to look at, well, actually part of this is already a requirement of law and, and needs to be done in terms of, of transparency and other requirements of data protection law. But the importance of this to us as a society is, 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 is what we need to think about. And what are those costs? Are they minimal in comparison to what we're really talking about here? But thinking about the electoral cycle as a whole is, is the key point, I would say. Um, we're not convinced that expanding the regulation and political campaigns beyond the current regulated period is going to be efficient in tackling some of these issues around <coughs> disinformation in particular. Um, rather than extending the regulation period of political campaigns to tackle issues like disinformation, we recommend instead to focus on some of the structural issues that are causing it. Um, that means a greater focus on bulk ad disclosure and limits on micro-targeting rather than ad moratoriums. Um, and while disinformation itself is a broad and complicated issue, um, there are a range of short and long-term measures that could be implemented to address both the symptoms and also the root problem of disinformation. So these could include platforms um, appropriately tweaking recommendation engines to reduce the virality of false and misleading content. Could be uh, closing fake accounts and bots that are creating false amplification. Um, and also being transparent about the political or possibly all of the ads on their platforms. Um, it's our understanding that the main concern around harming small campaigning groups and, and other bodies is um, around calls for 
like a total ban on online political ads um, or other requirements around um, increasing costs. But as of today, we don't support such an outright ban on online political ads as it stands. Can I, oh, sorry, yeah, can I just, I want to come back to both uh, you two who support the idea. Um, there are uh, some have been severe complaints from charities and third sector bodies who try to want to campaign on issues. And if you had a permanent uh, role in the way you're describing it, then each of those charities is going to have a look at everything they do in online crisis, for example, talking about homelessness, that have, you know, they be a big campaign at the moment. That would be a campaign which would count as being a political campaign forever. So they would have to identify all the costs they had arrived. The electoral commission would have to then be able to audit them as well as everybody else. Is that a price worth paying for the, the, the uh, not, you, John, as I said, perhaps not, but I think what you're saying is the price worth paying, that they would have to cover all those costs as well. I mean, I think as with all these things, the devil is in the detail and how it would be implemented, but I think we've also got to consider what the current status quo look like. Uh, and from our perspective, um, you know, the kind of the main political parties, by which I mean the Liberal Democrats and the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, um, by far and away have you know, the most developed um, kind of data sets or data assets um, that they kind of accrue outside of a regulated period. And so what that means actually going into a, a, a general election is that the kind of the main political parties have a massive advantage, have a massive advantage over the smaller political parties um, and can actually use these assets that they've accrued outside of the regulated period to kind of save costs and campaign more efficiently within it. Um, and so if there's no proper capture of those data assets that are being uh, accrued outside of the regulated period, we really risk kind of a narrowing of, uh, you know, political campaigning and reducing it to an even more elite activity than it already is. You haven't answered the point about crisis or any other, any other campaigning organisation. In, in terms of what it would mean for a kind of burden on charities, um, I guess that's a very reasonable point to make. Perhaps there could be, you know, just make it to make it as cheap and easy as possible for them. Some kind of cheaper, simpler company's house style organisation would be a possibility. I think just going back to Pascal's point, it, it's in the detail. What, what do we mean when we say ex expand um, the regulation of, of political campaigns beyond the period? So, how, you know, how do we define that? And I think what we're concerned here with is that political campaigns are not just starting and ending in the period immediately before the election. So there needs to be wider thought in terms of how we expand that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it applies the same, the same, in the same way for all actors. And that our concern is that uh, a number of activities, whether it's from ads that have run uh, to, to others, are not being captured and reported upon because of falling out with the period. Toby. I'm interested in this because um, traditional pre-digital uh, analyses of uh, electoral behaviour suggested that in fact most uh, people made their minds up 18 months or so way before an election itself and the campaigns themselves made very little difference. So this question of when the arbitrary cut-off, when things start, is uh, um, probably um, uh, not entirely helpful. But I am... Uh, uh, the position of charities is different in that they are regulated by the Charity Commission as to what they can and can't do. There are plenty of other actors who have an interest who are not regulated at all. Um, I'm just about old enough to remember the campaigns of Mr Cube, anybody else? Um, which was a campaign against the nationalisation of the sugar industry, I didn't even know that was a thing. Um, but uh, it wasn't in the Labour manifesto this last time, so come on. Anyway, but, but the, point, the, point, the, point, the point is that that was, a, that was a campaign which was run out over many, many years to um, influence public opinion. Now, what I'm interested in is whether or not you think there are ways or it is even legitimate to be trying to regulate and control things which are not necessarily run by charities and subjected to those constraints, not necessarily run by political parties, but are designed to deliver a political objective, or maybe that's what democracy is all about. Um, I think 
I might add, sorry, just to follow up on the previous point as well, um, if I recall correctly, you'd have to meet the public test and the purpose test under the Electoral Commission guidelines in order to be included in a regulated period. So, you know, you can make a... I think there's a kind of... Because I've been to training sessions from the Electoral Commission in the run-up to an election about what we can and can't say, um, and there's a kind of a degree of leeway about whether you can say you think something's good or bad and kind of to what extent that is encouraging individuals to vote a certain way. Um, so there's a degree, there's like a degree of discretion there. But um, I think as, uh, you know, you've just got to be careful. Charities are already very careful about what they do and don't say and if that can be construed as encouraging people to vote a certain way or not. Lord Holmes. Well, I'm not sure the others may have wanted to pick up on this. So, do you want... I just wanted to add, and I think taking that back to, to the transparency point, I think that's why there is that wider argument of why we need to ensure that when we're talking about ad libraries that we're talking about including more than just political ads as defined by the companies and, and having that wider definition. But we need that wider transparency to capture uh, advertising that might not be run by that specific political party, but that might be political to have that wider view um, so I think we need that wider transparency, but again, it goes back to the to the issue of you know what's what's the problem that we're we're trying to solve. John, well, I I'd just like to say that currently the the focus of this discussion is often on political parties or advertisers, um, and I just want to emphasise even more that platforms like Facebook and Google. Uh, equally, if not more responsible for the process of like delivering these ads, um, they have often have way more information um, on people that political parties and especially campaigning groups, for example, Crisis, uh, will ever have, and that makes it possible for them to optimize ad delivery and target groups and using lookalike audiences. Um, and that means that political parties or campaigning groups aren't needing to collect any data on people. Facebook just does the job of choosing the right ones for them. Um, but I guess as, as Ailey just said, like this stuff isn't <coughs> happening in a silo. And why is it not okay for us to be targeted with political ads, but it is okay to target me with an ad for insurance or for a job? Um, the ad tech ecosystem on the whole is what needs reforming. Uh, and that includes a strict and thorough implementation of GDPR or other data protection law. Um, and we need that better transparency and accountability, especially towards things like recommendation engines, what the platforms are choosing to show us. And that's just to better understand um, and fight against the spread of disinformation. Thank you. Lord Holmes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Good afternoon. Uh, building on the uh, point just made by Lord Harris, I'm tempted to ask you how you think Mr Cube fits into the political sphere. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't. <laughs> um, do you think there should be limits on the type of information that can be used for the micro-targeting of political adverts or indeed the use of uh, micro-targeting of advertising across the piece? Um, not least in what we've recently seen from Google and Facebook. Um, well, just before I answer, as a point of clarification, um, Google has placed some restrictions on the way that ads can be targeted, but mm -hmm. more could be done. Um, and Facebook has only announced new controls that allows, yep. to, allows users to turn off custom audiences from a list. So this might seem like a small positive step, but what it does in practice is, again, put the owners on consumers or users to protect themselves, and it leaves people vulnerable to micro-targeting with custom audiences. Mm -hmm. um, Mozilla believes that there should be limits on micro-targeting, and we're working <coughs> within our organization to determine what those reasonable limits might be. Um, micro-targeting is, is too broad of a term. Uh, without an agreed upon universal definition. And so any limits on micro-targeting need to be established with care. Um, some forms of targeting, such as targeting based on where you are at the moment, or based on like current context. So for example, if you're searching for shoes and you're shown ads for shoes, um, those should probably be acceptable, but Targeting based on behavioural or interest profiles, 
So that's collecting vast amounts of information about your interests and inferring other information from those. Um, that seems to be driving most of the problematic behaviour in the ad space right now. And the government should really explore limits on those forms of online targeting. So um, to add to what Jane uh, has said, I think there we need to look um, at the limits set by data protection law and it's imperative that the law is enforced, the outstanding complaints against data brokers, around, against the wider ad tech ecosystem and also against a number of the platforms. So it's essential that the law is enforced there and, and that does put some limits but we agree that there should be restrictions but part of the problem in defining firstly what we mean by micro-targeting and then what the red lines are has been this absolute dearth of transparency and the unwillingness of those involved to play ball, whether that be the platforms, whether that be the political parties, or whether it be other companies within this ecosystem. And we cannot rely on their business decisions in terms of what criteria they choose today or tomorrow, and we really do need to define those limits. And that's why transparency, I think, is so important in have, ensuring that we have the information available to, to draw those lines and, and take this forward in a, in a positive manner. Pascal? I think I would also definitely second Ali and John in saying that um, you know, data, prote data protection law is the kind of first imperative that we should follow in this. Um, I think I would um, also say that um, in the age where the system of value for campaigning is, is data and data sets, um, we need to really find a way of incorporating the value that data bring to a political campaign uh, more fully into the, the spending regulation framework that we have. Because, you know, if you go back to the um, fifth report of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, um, that was set up to kind of essentially limit the war chests of campaigns uh, based on how much they could um, afford to spend uh, in the newspapers or on billboards. Um, but now that reach is not so much being determined by money spent on newspapers, it's being determined by how large your data set is and or how good it is and the kind of the value that that's bringing to your campaign and that often is not being captured in the spending limits so after determining whether the data that campaigns are using is legal and obtained legally or not uh, there should secondly be a kind of a form of assessing well they've de they haven't declared the value of this data set how much they paid for it or if the data has been obtained freely and legally say for example through canvassing there should be a way uh, of appraising the value of that data set and the value that it brings to a campaign financially to see where it fits within the spending limits. Um, and we've proposed um, a basket of goods methodology could be used to kind of apportion value to data sets in that way. Thank you. Any words on this? To ask one quick question. Do you think the present regulations relating to spending lim limits are sensible? Are they enforceable? And how? How far away are we from having our own version of Citizens United, whereby corporates somehow be able to, are able to get free of spending limits? So in, our, in answer to the first point, um, I think one of our kind of key concerns is that in the age of data-driven campaigning, um, it's very difficult, A, to know what value data really brings to a campaign, which is why we propose this basket of goods methodology, but B, also just to know that campaigns are being honest and truthful about what they're using and how they're using it. Um, so that's why we've uh, also recommended that um, you know, the ICO, in collaboration with the Electoral Commission, ought to be able to uh, carry out data audits so they know how much data a, a, a campaign is going into an electoral cycle with. Uh, and that they should also be able to you know, carry out like, raids um, much easier and quicker than they can currently uh, so that you know, if there's a hint of something illegal happening, it doesn't happen after the fact of an election because you know, obviously an election is quite difficult, to a quite different to a commercial transaction. You know, if you're missold a pair of shoes, you can go back to the shop and um, return that pair of shoes. I think you know, good, good luck to any of us trying to return the result of, a, of an election. Um, that's, and that's you know, generally... Yeah, deeply problematic. Um, in terms of how far are we from a Citizens United style environment, um, I wouldn't go that far, but certainly it seems kind of apparent that there's a loosening of the edges of what is considered acceptable and how far uh, campaigners and parties are willing to push the envelope. Uh, and certainly so far, um, the reasonably limited, um, although not, you know, 
non-existent, but the kind of the reasonably limited um, actions of the regulators up until this point probably isn't doing much to deter them, although, of course, the regulators are themselves constrained by statute. So you'd agree that, as Lord Hennessy has put it, we're moving quite quickly away from the good chaps concept of running fair elections? It would seem that way. Thank you. Uh, Baroness Kidron. Uh, thinking about your various answers to the last two or three questions, whether there's an argument, and, and John's very excellent list of what you know, what is required for the platforms. Is there some, is there a case, would you say, for the platforms to be regulated for this level of transparency and all the things that you've brought up, but for the people who are actually placing it, so political parties, whether it's a, 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 a charity or a campaigning and so on, to have a code of conduct which they actually um, commit to, so that actually you can see they have made a commitment. That's not about money and regulation, but but upholding it, or maybe it is underpinned by regulation. But the but the actually regulatory piece goes in the engine because what everybody said all morning is that we need transparency, we need data transparency, we need audit, and all of these things. Is that a fair way to think about it, rather than ad spend or putting a lot of burden on the people uh, who are advertising? Um, a report came out this morning from the Centre of Data Ethics and Innovation um, and they've recommended that a new, regula uh, new regulator should require um, the platforms themselves to provide the ability to, for any anybody to look under the hood, um, so to speak, um, likely through a meaningful ad archive and that would address targeting practices. Um, it's, so worried about the front end, the, the campaign, the political party and so on. I just wondered whether there was another way of getting a consensus from that group of people if we had the back end sorted. No. I don't have an opinion on it right now. I, I, um, we are extremely concerned about the back end because in, mm. in the end that determines the front end. But um, I think that's where... Um, I would just labour the point that we really need to look at data protection law and actually ha making that a reality in terms of the obligations that are already existing in law and in transparency there and what can be done. So um, under data protection law, uh, there's issues in terms of political sphere. There's a condition that allows political parties uh, to process special category personal data without consent, and that's um, inherently problematic, that particular condition. There is um, the uh, government decided not to implement the derogation in GDPR that would have allowed civil society to bring actions. And often what we see uh, across the board, both in the political sphere and in the wider sphere of the digital ecosystem, is as an individual, it's extremely difficult to take any action. So that's another change there. And then, as I mentioned before, I think it's interesting to look at the code of practice mm. by the ICO in terms of the concerns around the political arena. And that uh, code of practice mm. should and, and hopefully will apply to a wide spectrum of actors from platforms to political parties and all those in between. But making that a statutory code of practice would make it much um, easier to enforce. And I think that's really what we've got, is we've got an enforcement <coughs> gap and looking at what the Electoral Commission is calling for, what the ICU is calling for, and have been calling for years, and making that a reality is, is really the first step. Yeah. I would I'd second that. Um, I think that probably the most difficult part of this is asking you know, political parties to you know, legislate against their own self-interest. Mm. Um, but um, certainly a good start would be putting the ICO's um, framework code of practice onto the statutory footing, just to give a bit of colour to kind of um, the kind of activities that the Open Rights Group has seen the parties carrying out. So we were, we've been recently running a campaign of subject access requests, which is a right of the data protection law, which allows you to see the data that an organisation is holding on you. So essentially you send off a letter to the data protection officer of a political party. Um, we've got back some interesting results. Um, there's a lot of um, kind of propensity scores, the likelihood of how much they think you are to kind of think a certain way. So to give an example, we've seen the Labour Party attempting to guess what ethnicity you might be. Um, we've seen the Conservative Party trying to guess the likelihood of what newspapers you read. 
Um, and we've seen the Liberal Democrats trying to guess things like if you're a pragmatic Liberal or not. Um, not, <laughs> not really sure what that means. Um, or your um, soft, to soft Toryness. Um, it, it's also interesting to note that quite often um, these profiles that the parties are building up of, of us are, are incorrect. Um, quite a lot of people that we got to send off um, subject access requests have been misgendered, for example. Um, so that might affect the kind of the messages they get and the engagement they receive. But really the question is not um, whether the parties are kind of reading your mind or not, or whether they're profiling correctly or not. The first point is, are they following the law? Mm. And the second point is, what effect is this having on the narrowing of our political debate and ecosystem? Thank you. Lord Knight. Thank you. Um, I have some concern about third parties and you know, individuals and other organisations who are unregulated using political advertising. So I'm interested in what restrictions you think there should be on who can use political advertising on uh, online social media and platforms. And should all advertisers, in the, as defined by, politically, have to be registered with the Electoral Commission? Ailey. So um, I think uh, that's, um, that's obviously an issue, and I think that's where it's important to look at the, the different definitions and the ways that the different platforms have ended up defining, defining political, political ads, issue ads, political issue ads, and there we need to be much more comprehensive and, and coherent uh, to ensure that we are actually capturing what we want to capture. And, but then it goes back again, I think, to the point we've raised about we need to, to capture much uh, to capture all the ads, but then it's looking at well, what other safeguards are there for political ads? And then I think in terms of registering with the Electoral Commission, again, it's it's the question of well, what do we want to achieve with that? Is it transparency or is it accountability? And I think that kind of answering that it helps decide whether that that is and. Um, going to actually make the changes that we want to see, whether the registration, what does that effectively effectively do or not, and how, how we can really ensure that there is accountability in the end of the day. John? Um, this question isn't something we've looked in, at, in detail um, at the Foundation, but at a high level, uh, we believe there's certainly a need to look at current legislation on current political campaigns and update them to take into account the changes and possibilities brought about by a new tech. Um, to your second point, uh, if offline political advertisers have to be registered with the Electoral Commission, then online political advertisers should probably have to be registered as well. Um, but coming back to that point around the definition of political, um, right now that's being left to the platforms themselves and um, defining what a political ad is or a political issue ad and um, that's really why we should we're encouraging the government to consider that all ads are included um, in any sort of transparency disclosure measures. Okay. Pascal. Uh, yeah, I think on a kind of a more general point, um, we contributed to the APPG on electoral uh, campaigning transparencies mm -hmm. report that came out recently. They've got some kind of good specific recommendations on this point. But I think, I think more generally, um, under the Political Parties Elections and Referendums Act, um, I think you can essentially withdraw yourself from being communicated to by political parties after one initial free post. But it, it's very difficult for you to do that online. So really in terms of what restrictions should there be on who can use political advertising on online social media, there's also a question about shouldn't you be able to kind of uh, cut yourself out of that environment if you want to? I mean, you know, you can take, you can take yourself off the electoral register or anonymise your presence on the electoral register, but once you're on the online sphere, it's very difficult to remove yourself from that conversation if you want to. And just, just as a supplementary, if I may, yeah. um, is there a danger that we over-regulate, particularly... Yeah, we've got the challenge of trying to anticipate where technology might have got to by the time, let's say, the next general election in four years' time. We could over-regulate, and then the direction of travel, which we kind of see already of a lot of conversation moving into private uh, WhatsApp-type um, platforms, then 
is where the whole political machine takes it to. And then we have no transparency at all, and we ha then have no regulation of that. So um, I think there, I think the first step is, as I've said already, enforcing the existing mm -hmm. regulation and then making slight changes to, the, to those existing frameworks to update them, and those will stand strong in the years to come. And then on the question of, um, of say, private messaging apps, I think one of the issues there is there's still data involved, and often that's someone's phone number. So where did that phone number come from? And one of the countries where this has been studied extensively is Brazil, for example. And that was a heavily under-regulated country where they've only just brought in their data protection framework. And it was the, the scraping of phone numbers and the, the wide abuse of phone numbers that was used there. So it does come back to, to the abuse of, of data. And there there's a, the framework that sits alongside data protection law, the e-privacy framework, um, which has been um, the proposals to update that have been stalled uh, at European level. But we must also make sure here that we update our law in that regard as well, and all the law that, that regulates um, uh, direct marketing as well. So I think that that will help with, with that particular concern because it goes back to the phone number. Uh, we don't have a particular opinion about the over-regulation of the market at the moment. Pascal? Yeah, I'd, I'd echo John on that. Yeah, okay. And that's a very, last, very relatively simple question. If there's any one thing that we could recommend or could be done um, to improve the regulation of political campaigns in a digital age, what would it be? One, your wish, your one single wish. Change the system of value for electoral regulation to one that focuses on data rather than purely cost or incorporates data into a cost-based system. Okay, Ailey. I think that the struggle will be to find just one thing to actually make the change that we need. But if I was to have one thing, I'd say make these changes to strengthen the data protection law that we have and to make it easier to enforce. That is the derogation for political parties, collective redress, and making a statutory code of practice. You mean possibly even enforce the laws that are already there? Yes, that, okay. that is <laughs> a, the number one. Not a bad, day. Not a bad starting point. John? Uh, the government should require platforms to disclose ads on their platform. Um, and publicly available ad repositories where they can be analysed by regulators and watchdog groups. Uh, this should include the targeting parameters for the ads and aggregate demographic information about who sees and clicks on those ads. And the government should seriously require um, all ads to be disclosed and not just political ads. Anyone? Any last point? Otherwise, thank you very, very much indeed. Very helpful. Thank you. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.